Good morning. Welcome to Gaston Christian Church. Glad that you're out there today. Welcome to those of you who are watching online. I'm glad that you're there. If you would stand, and I need my kids to come up. We're going to do only a God like you. Hope you remembered some of the emotions. Maybe Miss Amy will help you go through them wherever she's disappeared. That's okay. be seated. You know it's good when the trumpet player blows a pencil out of his horn. That's that's some great praise. I think that's out of Leviticus or something like that. Good morning again. Glad that you're here with us at Gaston Christian Church. Uh, Welcome to those of you who are online. If you get a chance, say hi in the comments. We'd love to know that you're there. I know it's something difficult to do, but if you can, we we appreciate that very much. If you're here in-house, a couple of things for you to do. One is to take a moment and do the tear-off on the bulletin and let us know that you're with us today. Uh, There's a box back there by the sound booth you can drop that into, or if you're a guest with us, let that be your offering to us today and just leave that on the on the seat if you want to. You can put it in the box either way, uh, but I don't want you to worry about that. There is one check-off I'm going to tell you about in just a moment. Also, if you're in-house, take a moment uh, to get your own communion. If you want to share in that a little bit later on, there's a station up front and in the two back corners. You can take that and have it your seat uh, for a little bit later on. I'll try to remind you in, in just a moment when we get up to do that. This coming Saturday is a, a ladies' gathering at the home of Debbie Wilkinson. Where are you, Debbie? She's in the nursery. She's heating up her tea. Well, that's very important. Okay. Um, when you see, uh, I'll, I'll try to 
see Debbie, her address is in the bulletin. There's a sign-up sheet on the table, or you can do the checkoff here either way. There's Debbie. There's Debbie. If you need to know how to get to Debbie's house, there's Debbie. You can find that out. Um, that's at 10 o'clock this coming Saturday. If you did not get your church directory, there are some back there for you to pick up uh, to take home, please. And if you're interested in church camp, either as a kid, especially as a kid attending C. Russ, who's C. Debbie to C. Russ. All right. There's Russ. There's Russ. Okay. There's Russ. If you need, if you, okay, there, okay, all right, all right. At this time, our students and teachers can be dismissed to their classes. Y'all can stand up and say hello to one another and get your communion, wave to the camera, and we'll continue singing in just a moment. Good morning. Actually, this got this, it has a little bit. It has a little bit of traction. I'll put it up here. Just as you are. 
be seated. pray with me? God, our Father, we, uh, we do know that you are a good, good God all the time. Every moment of every day in our ups and in our downs, when, when things are the way that we want them to be and when things are not how we think they should be, you remain good all the time. We're thankful that we can be together in your house among your people to share uh, this day with one another as we celebrate and honor you and worship you. We pray for our students and teachers next door as they uh, learn from your word that you would teach them these eternal truths that you have for them to know. 
We pray for those that are watching online and, and especially those that are home from illness or other uh, situations that, can, that prevent them from being here. May you embrace them and speak to them and bind them together as only you and your Holy Spirit can do. Father, speak to us today. Touch each heart. May we learn from your word as well. We love you. Thank you for being so good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you did not get your communion uh, earlier, now is the time that you'll need to do it because we're at that time in our service where we are going to remember that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and, and rose again. We're going to sing this, this song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, with the, the chorus, Wonderful Cross. And uh, after that, Jeff's going to come and share some thoughts to take us closer to the cross. And um, he'll lead us in taking the Lord's Supper. We'll sing another song after that. Um, if you need your communion, Robert's walking around with a tray. Just w raise your hand, and he'll bring it to you if you need it uh, there. Take uh, as much time as you can to prepare yourself to do what Jesus said and remember him in this way. Um, as we sing this song and as you listen to what Jeff has to share.
E. And I'm sorry, I've got to read this to you because um, I don't have it by memory, but it, it was it's very good. Eve. Eve's body came from a man, but not from a woman. God commanded Eve to stay away from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, or else she would die. The serpent tempted her in the Garden of Eden, and she was deceived. By disobeying God, Eve gave birth to death. She and her sin-stained husband were driven from paradise and denied access to the tree of life. None who follow Eve will ever experience life as God intended it to be. Jesus had a body that came from a woman, but not from a man. Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness of Judea, but he was not deceived. His father commanded him to lay down his life, and Jesus did that on Calvary's tree. By his obedience, he gave birth to life. Jesus had reopened paradise and given all of Eve's blood washed children the right to eat from the tree of life and eternally flourish with God just as he intended it to be. Father God, we're so thankful for your love and kindness to each one of us, to the grace you give to us. Father, we do not deserve it, but you give it to us with your love. We are so thankful for that. And at this time, we're thankful for that sacrifice of your son who embraced the tree. And there he hung with our sins, removing them. Father, we're thankful for his love and kindness also. For your spirit that dwells within us. And Father, as we take these emblems of the cup and the bread that we remember Christ's death and what it means to each one of us. In his name we pray these things. Amen. He took the bread and he gave it to, the, to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body. He also gave the cup to his disciples and said, take and drink. This is my blood. my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. And
without you. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I Please turn your Bibles to two places for me this morning, Ephesians chapter 2 and Romans chapter 8. In the Bibles and the seats in front of you, they're going to be on pages 977 and 944, respectively. Of course, you can use your own Bible and your table of contents and find them. Uh, Ephesians, in my Bible, is only about three pages uh, long, so it's kind of easy to gloss over if you're not uh, familiar with where it's at, so I hope you find that. I will have the scriptures on the screen this morning, but as always, I, I'd like for you to have it in your Bible so that you see it, especially in the translation that you're reading from. Uh, there might be some variation there, but I think we'll be okay uh, on all of that. For the next few weeks, we're going to look at what the Bible says about God's church. And I've titled this series, His Church, as a reminder that while we love our church, as we should, we, we, we better not forget that this is His church. Last week, we kicked off the series with the message, His Praise, and if you missed it, I, I cleaned everything off the stage and off the walls. It was completely barren in here, save for the communion table and, and the cross behind there. We didn't have PowerPoint, didn't have instruments, we didn't have anything except for uh, 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 just, just Jesus, and that was kind of the point. By taking all that away, we, we wanted to emphasize the fact that while the other stuff is good and helpful and even worshipful at times... Jesus only is more than enough to cause us to worship and, and to, to elicit our worship. This morning I want to look at one of the metaphors the Bible uses to describe the church, the family of God. Now, full disclosure, there's no place in the Bible where that phrase is found, the church is the family of God. The idea is there, the, the concept is there, it's, it's accurate and biblical, but there's no verse that says the, the church is the family of God. Well, sort of, but we'll get there in just a moment. But I want you to start, but I want to get you to think about what family means and perhaps broaden your definition behind, beyond your immediate family. What's the idea behind family? I, I don't know if we, I don't think we have any uh, former police or firemen in, in the congregation. I don't think we do. But if you've ever noticed uh, when a, a firefighter or a police officer dies, it's felt across all departments. Officers and firemen from all over the state, all over the country, even across borders there in one of those pictures that you see, they come out to honor their fallen uh, uh, serviceman. Why? Because there's this family concept. A camaraderie that exists simply because they're part of the force or part of the fire service. Veterans. Uh, uh, can I have my veterans stand this morning, if you can stand real quick? Just very, very good. Thank you for your service, by the way. Now, stay standing for just a moment. And, and not to belittle anybody at all. Did any of you serve in a squad or a a combat team Robert did I thought so if you didn't sit down for just a minute not because well, actually Robert you can too it's fine but my, my dad was in the Air Force he was a aircraft mechanic and I'm sure he had a team but he didn't go to combat and, and not to belittle what he did he great service but but I want to focus in on somebody that served in in a combat amongst a squad and I don't know what I'm talking about okay so after after sir, you can go ask Robert did he say what was right and Robert said no he was way off the mark but let's don't do that right now. Let's pretend I'm right, okay? In, in, in a squad, from what I understand, 
you have a bond between those that you serve with. And you may not even like the guy next to you, but in combat you trust that he's got your back and, he, and you're going to have his back, even if you don't like him. And you have this family, and, and I don't know, you can ask Robert after church, I didn't, ask, I didn't, didn't set this up. I, I bet Robert could probably name everybody in his squad. I bet he remembers them because they were family. They were put in that situation. That's the idea that I, I want you to have. A actually, HBO did this miniseries. Oh, I forgot to put that up there. Sorry. There's the picture of Emo Jima, the, the squad doing that. Uh, HBO did a series many years ago called Band of Brothers, right? Because these guys are family. They're, they're, they're locked in, united together. The caption there reads, if you can't see it, they depended on each other, and the world depended on them. When we talk about family and the church being a family, th this idea of, of the firemen and the policemen all coming together for their fallen uh, comrade or, or the squad that's out in combat that is, that is united to that purpose. That's what I want you to think about and, and have in your mind. A few weeks back I preached a series about what Jesus did and one of the things that he did was that he made us his child. Going back to the Old Testament, God called his people his children. And he was a father to them. And that concept continues in the New Testament. We are called brothers and sisters in Christ. We are God's family. I want to share with you from Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 18. Just 18 and 19. This is in the middle of one of Paul's thoughts. Not taken out of context, but we don't really have time to go into why Paul is saying all of this. But, but what he says is, is, is clear enough. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. That phrase, members of the household, translates a single Greek word that means just that. Those who belong to a particular household. The, the word comes from the same root that the word family is. It's, it's part of the family group of, of words there. And I wish that more translators had, had chosen to put uh, family in there. One did, the New Living Translation. This is the closest we get to the family of God in the Bible, by the way. So, you are, so now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family, they translate it. And that also helps us see Paul's overall point. In those early years of the church, there were divisions between those who had been Jewish for centuries. Who had, who had you know, drawn back to Abraham as our father and Moses brought us out of Egypt. And, and, and they recognized Jesus as the promised Messiah and so they became Christians. But they were Jewish in their heritage. There's a, a separation, a lot of divisions took place between them and the pagans who worshipped false gods, who were a part of Rome, who did all kinds of filthy, vulgar things and ate pork. Oh, can you imagine? And now they want to be Christians? you got to be kidding me. And, and so that's what was going on. So Paul is trying to reconcile them and say, look, you people who grew up with all the Jewish heritage and you people who didn't grow up with that, you're now one in Christ. You have the same access to the Father. You're both members of the same family. Paul says, wait just a minute. We are all part of God's household, his family. Now, I want to take you to Romans chapter 8. Yesterday, it, and, and we're going to go back to Ephesians. We're going to kind of pull things from both of them here. So don't lose your place on both of those. Yesterday at the Men's Breakfast Club, Bob uh, read all of Romans 8 to us. And it was it's just a great chapter, just a reminder. Especially for those of us in Christ, all of the promises that are there. Um, it's just a, a, a wonderful chapter. But anyway, in, in the midst of all that, Paul is writing to the, the Roman Christians there. Similar to what he wrote to the Ephesian church. Paul is reminding them and encouraging them and teaching them and us the rights that we have because we belong to Christ. Uh, let me get you to start at verse 14, just a few verses here. Again, in the middle of something else that Paul's talking about, but not out of context, just, just not have time to go through all the chapter here. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. 
For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Notice the familiar language that he uses here. Sons of God and adoption as sons. And by the way, do not feel excluded uh, if you're a daughter. This was just the generic way that it often used to talk about the children, whether it be male or female, it just uses that in a general sense. He calls them, uh, he says that he is our Abba, our Father. We are children of God. And he says children again in there. And, and heirs, and not just heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Jesus. Romans chapter 8 puts you and me on the same level as Jesus. And if you remember our sermon last week, I said nobody's on the same level as Jesus. Remember that? I said a big, whole big deal about that last week. And yet Paul says, but now we've been put as fellow heirs with Jesus. Is that not incredible? I grew up in the church. Dad was a preacher my whole life. When I was a child, we lived in the parsonage right behind the church, uh, about the same distance from here to the house uh, across the parking lot. We lived church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, and every day in between. The, the church office was my playground when I, before I went to school. I am so used to church and the church being the family of God that sometimes I just take for granted what an awesome thing that God has given us. I was blessed to be raised in a family with two loving, strong, faithful parents. I, I've never known anything but a strong family. It's a blessing from God. But again, sometimes I have to remind myself this awesome gift that God has given to call me his child and put me in his family. It's a great, awesome thing. God calls the church his family. The church is many things in the Bible. There are different descriptions and pictures of the church. The body of Christ, we're going to use that one next week. The church is a building or the temple of God. The bride of Christ is one of the metaphors used. And this description of the church as a family, this is a metaphor that he himself has, has chosen. He is our father. We are his children. As I said, we already spent some time a couple of weeks ago, the marvelous thing that Jesus did by making us God's children. I don't want to re-preach that, but today I want to emphasize the relationship aspect of that. Back in Ephesians, Paul says that we both, the, the Jews and the Gentiles, that's the both there, we have the same access to the Father through the Spirit. If you come to my house as a guest, I may tell you to make yourself at home. And that's an invitation for you to be comfortable, to relax, to feel at ease eating my food and using my furniture. But there are limits, okay? You're not allowed to go traipsing through my house and opening doors that are closed and piling through my drawers and going to my wallet and getting the credit card out and spending. If you need money, I'll loan it to you. But, but there are limits to make yourself at home, right? You understand that. If you're a guest, you're allowed to have a drink of water, okay? But you're not allowed to, I don't have a nice Corvette, but if I did, take my Corvette out for a spin. But if you're a member of my household, if you're my family, you do. My sons, my daughter-in-law, my brother, my sister-in-law, my dad, and of course my wife, they can call, they can interrupt, they can ask favors, they can borrow, they can enter, they can do whatever because they have access, they are family. That's the word and the idea that Paul uses. Through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. When Jesus died, the Bible tells us that at that moment, the veil in the temple that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, the, the holy of holies was the, the, the room that housed the the. Um, the Ark of the Covenant, and on the top of the Ark of the Covenant was called the Mercy Seat, and that is where God sat. Now, we know that 
that God doesn't locate in one place, okay? But, but in the Old Testament especially, that was the visible place where God dwelt. And only the high priest could go in there one time per year. Nobody else had access. Not at any time. But when Jesus dies, the Bible says that temple, that veil, was ripped from the top to the bottom. Symbolizing we all have access to the Father. We can get to Him any time we want. Any time, any place, for any reason. When we call upon God, no doubt about it, He hears us. His wisdom, the same wisdom that he used to create the universe, to lay the foundations of the earth, it is at our disposal. All we've got to do, James says, is ask, and God gives us wisdom. We have access to that. His mercy, his grace, his love, his whatever is not withheld from his children. We don't have to bargain for it. We don't have to perform for it. We don't have to be good enough for it. Simply because He is our Father and we are His children, we have access to it. To be sure, many people do not access those things. But God's children have access to it. Now listen, I know we struggle with feelings. We don't feel like God's listening. We don't feel like God cares. We don't feel like God has forgiven us. And I'm not discounting our feelings altogether. But I'm telling you with every confidence in those areas at least, if we are a child of God, those feelings are wrong. God may not give us all we want when we want it, but that does not mean He is not listening or does not care. We are His children and He has given us access to Him. I liken it to that, that, that veil being torn open in the temple. That God has given us permission to enter his throne room. Or scandalous here, okay? Brace yourself for scandal. His bedchamber. God says you can come in anytime you want. My door is always open to you. That's what that word access means. Okay, that, that's first. He, he has given us access. But then he also, he has established a house for us. When Jesus went into the temple courts and saw the money changers there and the sellers there, he threw over their tables and he drove them out. Drawing from the Psalms, Jesus shouted, Do not make my father's house into a house of trade. Now, Jesus knew that the temple, and, and remember, this is Herod's temple. Which we don't have time to go into all this, but Herod builds this magnificent thing as a way to placate the Jews, and it's it's not an abomination, but it's it's not Solomon's temple. Okay, it's 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 Herod's temple. All right, Herod's temple. Jesus knows that it's just stone and wood, and that one day soon it's going to be torn down brick by brick, stone by stone, and burned by by the Romans. Okay, Jesus knows that's coming, but he also knows that the temple stood and symbolized something. I'm often guilty of de-emphasizing the church building as a sacred place. And don't get me wrong, we are the church, not the structure. But at the same time, this place, this space, does have some sacredness to it. I hope you've never suffered a, a house fire. But if you were, I mean, it would be tragic. But if your family got out safe, you would still be a family, would you not? You, you, you would still be you. But there would be a great loss. And in the same way, if, if, if we lost the church building to a fire, we're still the church. The church still exists. We're not going to say, well, we're not, you know, Gaston Christian Church is gone because it burned down. No, it did not. We are still Gaston Christian Church. But we would suffer a, a great loss in all of that. Jesus was zealous over the structure that was known as God's house because of what it symbolized. This place, whether it be here or another location, under a tent or in a rented facility, whatever, this place is where God's people gather. Hebrews 10.25, do not neglect meeting together. I know times have changed, but something is to be said for families that make it a priority to eat together at supper time. 
to be together, that, that when it's supper, everybody, whatever they're doing, they stop and they do it and they come down and they eat supper. And I know that doesn't happen to every family. I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm just telling you that if you do that and if you've done that, you know what a blessing it is. There's something special, something unique, something needed and something fulfilling by coming together as God's family. This is a place where God's children gather. But it's also a place where we are sheltered. There's a picture found in many places in Scripture of God spreading His wings to cover us. Psalm 61, 4. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings, the psalmist writes. This place is a, a place of safety and shelter for us. Back in February, we acquired two kittens at our house. Aww. Princess Minnow and Guppy. It took them a little while to become accustomed to us and, and, and to trust us. And just recently, I think this past week, we started to let them go outside. Now listen, they are both hunters. They love to stalk and hunt and climb. They, 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 this morning, Minnow brought, Brian started putting collars on them when he put them outside. And she brings her collar up to me because she wanted to go out. I mean. Anyway, but we were afraid to let them out. We've got feral cats in the neighborhood. We have all kinds of things, and we just, you know, they're not really fighters, but they are hunters. So Brian started taking them outside and letting them go out, and we usually leave the door cracked, and when they get scared, they come running back to the house, which is what we want them to do. We don't want them to be scared, but we wanted to make sure that we had trained them and taught them that our house is the place of safety. Now, probably they think it's the house of food, which is why they really come back. But, but, but let's, don't, let's don't talk about that, okay? Let's talk about the place of safety and shelter, all right? They know that this is where they can go and, and run to. Uh, last night, uh, Brian had some friends over to the house, and they're just not used to strangers, and we came home and couldn't find the cats. They were both hiding under Brian's bed. That's where they go when they get scared because they know that's a safe place. I don't know how... Cats know things, but we'll just pretend they do, okay? For the illustrative purposes, we're going to call it that, okay? This is true for this place and for God's family. He provided for us this place of shelter, this place of safety, surrounded by people who live according to His rules, so there is love and there's grace and there's encouragement and there is peace. When, when Jesus was speaking to his disciples the night before he was arrested, on the night that he's in the upper room, he, he says these words. Get, when we get the part in yellow, read that aloud with me, okay? Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and you will... And I will take you to myself that where I am you may be also. This house is just a model, a temporary example of the permanent place Jesus is building for us as part of God's house. While we don't need to think of the church as brick and wood structure, we don't need to avoid it either. In his wisdom, God wanted the church to gather together. Wherever that may be, he provided for us a house. He is our father. We are his children. He's established a house for us. And we belong. Perhaps this is the most important meaning behind the family imagery. It's what Paul was communicating to the Ephesians. We are no longer strangers and aliens. There is a condition where people are aliens and strangers. That, that word aliens is the, the word that means a, a, a traveler who's in a land not his own. Who, who, who may be an invited guest, but he is not a citizen. He doesn't belong there. But Paul says that no longer describes us because we do belong. You ever been someplace where you didn't feel like you belonged? Where you just, you know, something was wrong? been a few times in my life, again, feelings can mislead us, but sometimes they're accurate. A few times in my life, I just felt like I did not belong. The people there, the atmosphere, the, the sounds, the environment, all of it just felt wrong for me. Many, many years ago, Mary Beth and I had only been married a year or two. Uh, my best friend from high school asked me to do his wedding. We were living up in Cary, and 
Um, I went to the rehearsal for us because I'm doing the wedding, and, and he's, after the rehearsal, he said, hey, me and my friends are going to go out. Why don't you come with us? I hadn't seen Blaine in, in, in quite a few years, and I'm like, eh, let me call Mary Beth. And I called. She said, oh, you can go. It's fine. Well, it wasn't the, oh, yeah, you can go. It's fine. It was, it was, a, it was legitimate. You know, you haven't seen Blaine. That's okay. But in addition to that, well, well first he, he goes, he says, we're going to this bar. And, and I am not a bar guy. Never have been, just not. And it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, going to Chili's and getting the takeout from the bar. It was like, I don't know what, I, don't, I, can't, I don't know what to describe it for you. It was a, it was a full-blown bar, okay? And I'm sitting there at the bar drinking my Diet Coke or Sprite or whatever it was I'm drinking. I don't think I drank Diet Coke back then, but anyway. But not just that. And did anybody bring tomatoes today? Good, because I don't want you to throw them at me. All right, all right, just making sure. On top of it, Mary Beth had, had, had just started her job working as a pediatric in-home nurse, mostly with um, terminally ill ki- children, and her patient died, and she had been there. And I'm sitting there with Blaine, with his friends that I don't know, in a place that I did not belong, knowing that I really belonged someplace else with my wife. And the whole time I'm there, I just have this feeling like I do not belong here. And I've got to get out. I don't know if you've ever felt that or not. I hope I described it well for you. I could feel it in my bones. That was 35 years ago, and it still brings up these negative feelings. God says, however, in my house... We do belong. We're no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens. We have ownership and rights because we are part of the family. We are not temporary guests. We do not wear out our welcome in God's house. We are not conditional members like like at a country club or a gym where you got to pay membership dues. And if you don't, you get scrubbed off the rolls. We belong. And here's how we know this. We have, we have a new identity. My son Brian uh, is teaching college level biology at York High School. He's an adjunct professor at York Technical Community College. And he has an official name badge that says York Tech on it with his picture and everything. And it gives him access. There's that word again. To the building, the right to be there. Because he belongs there. we got other people here. Some of you have worked in places where you've got name badges that gives you access Tony uh, has a badge that allows him to get right up to nuclear reactor rods where he can take and hold them in his hand and and fiddle with them if he wants to because he's got the access card to do that, okay? Don't do that, Tony, by the way. Okay, all right, all right. As a professional, let me just tell you how to do your job, okay? All right. Brian started at the high school, and and, and I was joking with him a few months ago. I said, so does this mean you get access to the teacher's lounge? Because, you know, as a student, everybody's like, you know, there's a magical door that says teacher's lounge behind it. All kinds of cool stuff happens, right? You know? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I can go to the teacher's lounge. He's joking with me. Yeah, I can go to the teacher's lounge now. And I was talking to somebody. I don't know if it was Randall and Melissa because they, their kids are both teachers. I, don't, I was telling somebody about it. And they were laughing and said, yeah, my, my kid's like, yeah, there's nothing special about the teacher's lounge. But, um, but that's what it means. He's got this identity. He is a staff member. And the sign that says, authorized personnel only, means nothing to him because he is now authorized. Because he has that identity. And that's what God has given to us. We belong here. We've got the access badge that says we are a member of God's house. And we can just blow through doors that other people are not allowed to go through. Two years ago, my oldest son, Josiah, was married to Megan. On March 17th, her name was Megan Wilkinson. On March 18th, her name was Megan Patterson. On March 17th, we were a family of four. A nice, even, dividable by two number. On March 18th, we're a family of five, which is a prime number, which is really cool, too. So... Although she still belongs to her mom and dad, she is now part of our family. 
She has a new identity as a Patterson. Admittedly, it's not as great as it might sound, but still, she's a Patterson now. She gets that new identity. We, we symbolically gave her a ring that's identical to one that Mary Beth has. To, to, to say, you are one of us. And she can now do anything she wants in our family. She has full access because she is now our child as well. You see, in Christ we have been born again. Jesus tells Nicodemus in John 3 about being born again. 1 Peter 1.3 says that we have been given a new birth. We've, we've been new, newly born into a new family. We've been given a new name. Isaiah 62 2 says that we will be called by a new name. And Revelation says that we've been given that new name. Christian. And just like a bride who takes on the name of her husband, we too, the bride of Christ, take on his name. Christian, we belong to him. We have been adopted by the Father, and now we can call Him Abba. This comes from what we read out of Romans 8. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. A few years ago, I, I did this series on the name of God from the Old Testament, Yahweh. Six sermons in all. On God's holy name, so holy, the Jews refused to pronounce it. They won't even write it. If you know a, a, a pious Jew today, they will spell G underscore D. They will not write God because they value his name so much. And this name Yahweh was so sacred. And we, we spent six weeks now telling you how great the name Yahweh was. I am. And what all it meant and all of that. And that we ought to be calling God Yahweh. A few months later, I came across this article. And I wish I'd thought to save it. I have no idea where I read it, who wrote it to give them credit. Or to see if they were right. But anyway. The gist of the article was, we don't need to call God Yahweh. And I was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. I just told my congregation six weeks of how God's name is Yahweh. And we ought to be calling him Yahweh. And what it all means. And blah, 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 blah. Anyway, I read on the article. And they went on to say, as powerful, as sacred, as holy, as awesome the name Yahweh is. We've been given a better name to call God. Daddy. How cool is that? Our new family comes with this new identity. And, and, and then there's this. We are loved. Hand in hand with belonging, it, it, that's what family means. We love each other and we are loved with an incredible love by our Father. You parents out there. Especially those of you who have newborn babies. But, but if you can hearken back to your very first child. No, nothing against second borners. I'm one of them, okay. But, but I just want to I, I I draw up that, that feeling you had the very first time you held your first child. And if you've got a stone cold hard heart, this won't apply to you. Shame on you. But an overwhelming sense of love that comes over when you hold that child and you're going wow that's my baby and, and you are filled with love that you didn't even know you had it just comes out of nowhere and you have that love and, and for me it was absolutely overwhelming now listen if we who are flawed who are selfish who, who are sinful, who are weak, and all of that. If we can have that kind of love for our child, can you imagine what our perfect, eternal, omnipotent Father has for us? That's how much He loves us. In fact, here's what that kind of love looks like. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. So, so why is all of this so important for us to know? Well, although churches are not perfect, God wants his family to be perfect. And, and, and what I mean by that, I know there are bad churches out there and bad Christians who do bad things, who hurt others. 
who do not act like they should. Just like there are dysfunctional families in the world. Those are not the examples. If you've been hurt or disappointed or let down by someone in the church, don't blame God or his family. Don't allow the actions of a flawed, sinful people give you reason to leave God's family. We're all messed up to one degree or the other. And some of us are better at hiding it than others. But we're all messed up. And and, and God, in his infinite wisdom, put us in a church full of flawed people. He didn't didn't call together the perfect, because there are none, but he didn't call together the perfect and say, you be the church and let everybody else just flounder away. He, He put us in here with all of our warts and our foibles and our troubles and our dysfunction. And sometimes we mess it up. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we get it wrong. I don't want to get it wrong. I work really hard at not getting it wrong. But I am not perfect. And I don't want you to put me in a place where you think that I never make mistakes. Because when I do make one and you see it, you'll be crushed. I want to make sure you understand that God's family is perfect, even if we aren't. Okay? And, And sometimes, sometimes we get hurt. But don't blame God for that. Blame Satan. He's the one trying to tear it apart. Okay? So that's the first thing I want you to see. God's family is very important. God has made a place where you are loved, where you are wanted, and where you belong. So don't buy into the lie that the church is unnecessary or unimportant. There are a lot of things that compete for your time and attention on Sunday mornings and throughout the week and and when church activities arise. And I'm not trying to make you feel guilty or anything like that. I want to impress upon you, though, the importance of family, of God's family. When the dinner bell rings, we need to come to the table. It's not any more difficult than that. God wants us to be together and share together. It's very important to him. Do not forsake the assembling together, the Bible says. So God's made this place where we are loved, where we're wanted, and and where we belong. It is true, but we did not spend any time on it today. But God does have expectations for his children. How to act, how to talk, how to think. There's more to this than we have time for. But listen, God is gracious and loving and patient. Those who want to come near to him need not fear. And his family, when we are acting like his children, like we're supposed to act, we too are loving and accepting and gracious and patient. So if you need a family... If you need a new identity, if you need a new name, Christian, if you need forgiveness, if you need access to the Father, He has given us a way to do that. If you've never confessed that Jesus is your Lord and you want to do that today, if you've never been baptized and and had your sins washed away and been born again the way the Bible teaches, we want to give you that opportunity. Um, Let's stand together. We're going to sing... Um, You are awesome in this place. And if you have a decision to make public, just meet me down front. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, Abba Father. You are worthy of all praise. To you our lives we raise. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, Abba Father. You are worthy of all praise. To you our lives we raise. 
you are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are worthy of all praise. To you our lives we raise. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. So glad that you were with us this morning, and thank you for those of you who are online watching us. Appreciate that very much. I want to share with you a couple of things. Um, Frances Belk has been moved out of Cortland Terrace, but don't know where she is just yet. Um, but she does have her cell phone. You can reach her uh, and, and check on her. Also, Pat Bowers took a fall this week, broke her neck. Uh, they did surgery on Friday and repaired the break, but they might have to do some more surgery. Um, there's some arterial, possible arterial damage that they've got to uh, take um, I talked to her daughter, uh, Dorothy, uh, yesterday, he said that Pat has her cell phone. She can talk on the phone. She may not answer, but you're welcome to call her and check on her. Um, but she's right now at CMC Main uh, Atrium downtown, Charlotte. Uh, I th she got moved out of ICU, but not sure if she's in a regular room or step down ICU. But uh, uh, anyway, Shane Huff had his surgery on his foot on Thursday, Wen Wednesday, I think it was, Wednesday. Um, and is doing well. He is staying off his foot like he's supposed to. Um, so he's not here today for that. But um, uh, keep him in your prayers as well. Again, thank you for being with us. We're going to close in prayer and be dismissed. God, our Father, um, thank you for the family that you've given to us. And, and for the rights and the privileges that come with that. Because you love us so much. Uh, Father, may we honor you. May we represent you well to the world. We pray for those that need your healing, for Shane as his foot heals, and hopefully this time uh, for good and, and give him relief from the pain and the discomfort he's had. We pray for Pat, that she would heal from that and, and pray for the additional damage that um, whatever needs to take place will, but uh, just ask, lift her up and her husband Norb as um, she is the one who normally takes care of him, just be with him as well. Uh, Father, um, we love you, we thank you for loving us and for always hearing our prayers. Keep us safe as we go home. Bring us back together so that we can gather in your house among your people again. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.